Hello everybody and welcome to Commodity Culture where our goal is to make you a better investor in the commodity space. My name is Jesse Day. Before we dive in, standard disclaimer, nothing here is investment advice. Do your own due diligence and today's guest is an expert in the precious metals space and the founder of the TF Metals Report. We're going to be talking all things gold and silver along with getting his thoughts on the ongoing war on cash expanding global conflict and what it means for financial markets and much more. It's Craig Hemke. Great to have you back on the show. Jesse, it's always a pleasure. Thanks for the invitation. Well, it's been a while since I've had you on. So let's start with your broad overview of the gold and silver sector, starting with gold. What are the main themes and trends you're watching when it comes to gold that you think people should be paying attention to right now? Oh, goodness. Uh, what a year we've had uh, to begin with. Um, you know, we, we started strong in a time when you would have thought price would have been weak. You know, a dollar index was rallying, you know, the future rate cut expect. I mean, we started the year, they were talking about seven rate cuts and that went all the way down to zero or one by June. And under those kind of conditions, you'd have thought that gold would go down. Instead, it's been charging forward all year long. We're currently up 30% year to date. Um, that, I don't know, you know, how much farther can it go in one year? You know, I, I've said I'll, 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 to lots of folks, you know, that'd be like, well, you know, if the banks manage the price of gold, how come it's gone from 400 to, you know, 2,500 over the last 20 years? And that's because, I mean, the banks and their traders can profit from a 10% rally because it's up, down, up, down, up, you know, that kind of thing. They can manage that just fine. It's 30%, 50, which we've never had a 50% year. Uh, that gets them upside down um, in a lot of their positions. And that's kind of what it seems like they are now. If you look at the commitment of traders report, doesn't mean that price can't go higher. Uh, it certainly can, but it's gonna take uh, more speculator interest, institutional interest, on the long side in gold in all its forms because there's not many shorts left to be squeezed so it's going to have to be continued buying to keep pushing us farther that's why things like we just wrapped up the quarter yesterday um the month end charts and certainly the quarterly charts are really important in revealing what is a serious bull market and that's where you know that that money comes from to keep propelling gold higher because, you know, people, look, what is it? The current number is like 72% of all global financial advisors don't even have any gold at all for their clients. You know, if that starts moving up, that's where the, the continued buying comes from. So anyway, we've had a heck of a year. Uh, we enter now into October in the fourth quarter, which I, I mean, Jesse, all bets are off, man. I, it's, there's no way of knowing what lies ahead, not just for the precious metals, just for <laughs> life in general. So it's been a hell of a year and we'll see where we go from here. All I know is I'm sure glad I own the gold that I do. And uh, anybody watching us wondering about gold, wonder if they have enough. If you have, if you have to wonder if you have enough or if you should get any, you probably should get some because uh, we're in some tumultuous times. That's for sure. Yes, absolutely. And we're going to get a little bit deeper into the tumultuous times a little bit later. Let's discuss silver here, holding strong around $31.00. 60 cents, I believe, 31.30 at the time of this recording, um, broke the $30 level and is, is holding steady, which uh, many see as an indication of great strength up ahead. How do you see things playing out for the silver market? Well, it's, it's aggravating for many people, right? Because uh, even though silver closed really well to end the month and the quarter, and you're like, hey, look at that, you know, 31, $32 that's the highest it's been since uh, for a monthly close since january of 2013. so if you've been buying all along like i have and have lowered your cost basis down into the teens okay that's fine but you know if you bought the last silver you bought was in january 2013 you're just now even right and so it's just aggravating as all heck my suspicion is if gold keeps going up silver will rush again to catch up that's might have been about the last time we spoke jesse i don't recall you know it uh, I remember it, telling folks back in March and in April, you know, as gold was charging, but silver was still around $24, $25. I'm like, well, the gold-silver ratio is not going to 100. I mean, eventually silver is going to rush to catch up. And that's exactly, I mean, it went from 24 to 33 in about six weeks. If gold keeps moving forward here, the same thing will happen again. Uh, and you'll get another 
burst forward. Um, but it is aggravating to watch. There's no question about it. It's thought more as of a, as a commodity than it is a monetary metal still by most of the world. And so it kind of has more in common with something like copper than it has gold in the, for the traditional investment strategy, whoever, you know, whatever that is. And so we kind of need all commodities to go, you know, kind of forward to drag silver along with it. And that may be, we may be on the verge of that. You know, the dollar index is at a very important technical level. If it should start to trade down below 100, that's going to drive a bid for commodities in general. I remember seeing the thing in August that as if you look at a basket of commodities, some 20 commodities, um, as measured, I think it was Reuters or Bloomberg, the hedge funds collectively as a group were more net short that basket of commodities than they'd been in 20 years. And so you think, well, that's got to be a contrarian sign. And so if we get the dollar to fall, uh, we get gold to keep going, silver will rush to catch up again. And uh, we have the chance of finishing the year pretty strong. But again, those are some ifs. And there are just, I mean, I know investing is always about ifs and planning and trying to have as much foresight as you can. But as we enter this final five week period before the U.S. election um, and with everything that's going on geopolitically, uh, it's pretty hard to make any, you know, declarative statements about this is going to happen next. I mean, we're living in some unprecedented times. And so it's people need to stay pretty nimble and uh, and try to keep an eye on maybe the big picture, not so much the day to day swings, but, you know, ultimately where some of this stuff is, is headed. Hey guys, just a quick break to hear from today's sponsor, Arc Silver Gold Osmium. They offer personalized service and competitive prices with no minimum purchase for silver, gold, platinum, or osmium. Here's just some of the comments left on this YouTube channel about Arc SGO and owner Ian Everard. Have bought from Arc, good source and price. I cannot say enough good about Ian and his company. He is the most honest individual I could find in order to buy precious metals. If you are looking to buy precious metals, I recommend Ian at Arc Silver. He is a straight shooter. So go to arcsgo.com and contact Ian Everard today at 307-264-9441 or by email at ian at arcsgo.com and make sure to tell him that Commodity Culture sent you. One of the last times I had you on the show, you said that the gold mining sector will rip your heart out, but you still had conviction. If we look at both the GDX and GDXJ, they've had a pretty decent performance so far this year, but they have not outpaced gold itself. They're pretty much on par with gold. Many expected the mining stocks to be a levered play on gold. What's your current view here on the mining stocks? It's maddening, isn't it? Uh, even just for the just completed month, of September, gold was up 5%, where the last five years in September, gold's been averaging down 3%. Well, it goes up five. Silver goes up eight. And the GDX was up three. You know, and it's, oh gosh. My site has always been about stacking and accumulating physical metal for your safe harbor, Inflation protection, purchasing power protection gets you through this storm, this transition period that we're now clearly in uh, of monetary systems. Um, the mining, I swore off the mining shares a couple of different times over the last 15 years because I, that one, they just destroy capital in, in a lot, you know, because, and they, they don't hedge themselves worth a damn in terms of inflation. And so their costs are constantly going up and eating into their margins. And so when the price of gold and silver going down and inflation is going up, I mean, the things just, uh, they don't do well. Now, the problem has been, and the frustrating part has been, is the price of gold and silver has been going up this year. And yeah, the shares are up, but they're not dramatically up. And in the end, that gets to a simple supply versus demand. There's, you got to have more buyers and sellers. And the sector as a whole is so, not even... Unloved. Remember, remember, remember when when we were younger. I remember hearing the adage about you know the opposite of love is not hate. You know you don't f fall in love with somebody, and then when it doesn't work out, you don't hate them. You just kind of become ambivalent, right? And that's kind of what the sector is. Is just ambivalence. I mean, it, people don't even. It's not even on people's radar. You know the average. Financial planner, uh, stockbroker, 
um, even all the way up to hedge fund, you know, home office, you know, the, the people that run a couple billion dollars, man, they're all worried about growth. You know, you run a hedge fund and you're getting two and 20 every year, right? You're getting your 2% management fee and 20% of your profits. You need growth. You don't, you're not worried about what Newmont is making and they're all in sustaining costs, man. You want to be an NVIDIA and all these other growth stocks so that your two and 20 keeps growing. You could give a damn. And you're sure as hell not going to own any physical gold because it doesn't pay interest. You can't wrap it in a fee, right? And so it's just not even on people's radars. And so I think the mining shares, particularly the, for me, the sweet spot is kind of the, not, not the big ones like a Newmont or a Barrick. It, someone like uh, Agnico Eagle or Alamos or some of these, or you know, Wes Dome, the ones that produce but keep their costs really low, you know, and, and they're making the price of gold is double what their costs are to get it out of the ground. I mean, for crying out loud. Um, okay, I'm I'm happy buying those. Um, but again, as a sector, I think that's the problem. I mean, they're just outside of you and I talking about it. You don't hear, you know, uh, stockbrokers talk about it with their clients. You certainly don't hear it on Bloomberg TV, CNBC. And so till we get to the point where, you know, it's on, you know, that kind of top of mind, we continue to kind of languish. Now, the hard part, Jesse, is my experience has been with these things. When they go, they go, right? I mean, you go back to... Um, uh, remember it well, January of 2016, the Huey index bottomed out at 99.16 on like January the 16th or January the 19th or something like that back in, yeah, I remember it well. The date was one of those dates. And over the next eight months, it went to 280. Okay, so the thing tripled in eight months. And that's the problem. It goes up so fast. If you're not on board at the beginning, you end up chasing or you end up buying in at the end and then down they go again. So uh, that's, that's, again, what is so difficult. That's why it'll just rip your heart out sometimes. Um, anyway, that's a long answer. I've had a lot of coffee. I don't know if I answered your question. <laughs> you absolutely did. Um, I had Simon Hunt on the show recently. He thinks that a gold-backed BRICS currency will be a serious rival to the U.S. dollar within two years. Now, some accuse Simon Hunt of being hyperbolic. I'm, I'm not saying he is or isn't. But I also spoke to Lee Gehring and Adam Rosenswag, the least hyperbolic data-driven analysts in the commodity sector. And they said they expect a monetary regime change up ahead with gold involved in some way. I'm wondering what your thoughts are on that geopolitical picture how you may see or not see gold being reintroduced into the monetary system. First, let's go back to gold so far this year, because the fact that it is up 30% in an environment where, you know, all these other things are happening, especially the first year, somebody's buying, right? And you see, I mean, we've witnessed the central bank gold buying now for a couple of years at record levels, and it continues. Most of it outside of the G7 nations that kind of rely on the dollar primarily. Okay, so somebody, it appears, is getting ready for something. I mean, I think that's a logical deduction. Why would um, other nations of the world want a dollar alternative? Well, I mean, I, I've said it multiple times. The biggest event of 2022 was, well, I mean, you could, it obviously, it was the war in Ukraine and all the people that have died, you know, senselessly, needlessly. But that first weekend of March that year, about two weeks after Russia invaded, 10 days maybe, the U.S. did two things. They froze all of Russians, Russia's uh, non-domestically held foreign currency reserves and kicked them out of SWIFT. And any logical foreign leader, whether they're friends of the United States or not, would sit back and go, well, at some point, my nation's interests are probably going to run counter to theirs. And if this is what they're going to do, if I, you know, don't toe the line, shit, I better come up with, we better come up with a plan. So you would think there would be behind the scenes, countries that, you know, can see over the horizon and go, yeah, we better, you know, we don't want to get locked out. So we better start up our own SWIFT system. We better come up with our own trading currency. So, okay. So then if you do that, how are you going to get, how are you going to feel comfortable using it? Well, you back it with gold and I, there's, or at least partially with gold. And I've seen reports, uh, again, whether they're accurate or true or not, 
that the plans are something that's 40% gold and 60% foreign currency, kind of like the SDR currently is now, the special drawing rights. It's just a basket of all the major currencies, right? That this BRICS basket, this BRICS unit, whatever you want to call it, would be 40% gold. And then, you know, the renminbi and I don't know, the ruble. I mean, you go down the list of, of all the other countries that would participate. That's inevitable. Uh, people don't like to think that, but the US dollar has been the world's reserve currency for 80 years now. It wasn't prior to 1944. It won't be forever. This is a cyclical thing. It is not though what people often portray it as is some binary thing where one day the dollar is the reserve currency and everything's hunky-dory and the next day it's not and everything blows up. It's, it's death by a thousand cuts. It's incremental. It's something that over time reduces demand for the US dollar. And so I would then just relate this to a simple supply demand discussion that most everybody watching is probably remembers from, you know, high school or university or whatever. If you have of any good, I have oranges, <laughs> widgets, you know, whatever. If you have increasing supply and falling demand, those curves move and it results in a lower price, okay? Anything, and that's what we're talking about here. Increasing supply of dollars to constantly be serving this exponentially growing debt servicing. At the same time, this, these alternative trading units reducing the demand for dollars, which re increases the devaluation, the falling value, the val falling price, however you wanna look at it, of the dollar in this case. And if that's the case, that's obviously very positive for gold. So in the end, it's a win-win. You've got kind of a remonetization of gold if those plans, you know, as we've seen reported are correct. Hmm, that's an eye-opener for people. At the same time, it drives down, it accelerates the devaluation of the dollar, which in any historical, you know, current terms is good for gold. So this is, um, these, are, these are very gold positive. I'm not saying they're positive for your next door neighbor who's unaware of all this stuff, but if you can anticipate it yourself, which again is all part of what we do here, um, then at least you, know, you can be prepared and, and uh, see your way through. Well, let's talk about expanding global conflict because the Israel versus Hamas Hezbollah war is getting particularly vicious. We saw the leader of Hezbollah assassinated in airstrikes that killed thousands of people. Um, as we speak, there are rumors swirling around social media that Iran is preparing a strike against Israel. Um, to what capacity, we're not yet sure. Maybe by the time this goes live tomorrow, we'll obviously know more. Setting aside who is right or wrong here, how do you think the expansion of this war could impact financial markets and gold and silver in particular? Could this drive safe haven demand for the metals? It can certainly drive safe haven demand for the metal. You can see you have those occurrences where the, the dollar and gold are going up at the same time, right? Just off just simple safe haven demand. Um, I look by the time people watch this, maybe Iran will have changed their mind and they won't launch this uh, ballistic missile attack. That's all the news this morning. I would say that's a very credible thing because of course, and obviously the U.S. has God knows how many satellites over Iran watching their every move. And if you're getting ready to prepare to launch some ballistic missiles, I mean, that's not just something that, you know, here in the U.S., we can press a button and boom, away they go, right? That's the Armageddon we all worry about. But when they're on trucks and, you know, hidden in bunkers and stuff like that, you got to bring those things out first. And that's clearly what the U.S. satellites are picking up. And that's why they think this is imminent. And of course, maybe by the time this is published, maybe that won't happen. But um, I suspect it's going to. And now, you know, now the, the can of worms is opened. I mean, Israel will strike back. Um, this is, I don't know if ballistic missiles can be stopped by this Iron Dome thing. Hell, I'll give you something really scary, Jesse. Um, what if, I mean, Iran's been working on a nuclear program for 20 years. People have always said Israel has nuclear weapons that they got from South Africa or whatever, you know, over the time or whatever. Um, what happens if, even if Iran doesn't have a new, what if they just have a dirty bomb? You know, what if they just put a bunch of, and it's boom, and it comes down on Tel Aviv. And 
I, I, look, I sound like a crazy man, right? I, and who am I? I always just joke. I joke with the people on my side. I'm just a dope with a MacBook, right? I'm just some guy that just watches things and reports on things and tries to make sense of it. I don't know if that's going to happen. But holy crap, Jesse, what if it does? And then what if Americans get hurt in this? And the U.S., which is vowed, you know, then all of a sudden the U.S. is involved. Iran has treaties with people. What if you talk about how does this impact the markets? What if Iran says, okay, you know what? We're just going to go ahead and put out our mine laying ships into the Strait of Hormuz and shut off whatever that is, 20% of the world's oil, oil supply or whatever that is that flows through there. I mean, all these things. And then the practical impact, the practical Im impact then on top of this longshoreman strike here in the U.S. where longshoremen up and down the East Coast are now on strike and they certainly don't look like they're going back to work. And even if, if uh, the Biden administration forces them back to work through that Taft-Hartley Act, they'll just go back to work and stand around. I mean, they don't have to unload 30 ships a day. They're going to unload three, you know, just take their time, lollygag. I mean, there's a lot of stuff. So in the end, okay, let's relate this back to metals. What do you do if you're Jerry Powell? You know, everybody says, why is he cutting rates? The stock market is all-time high. The economy is, you know, still growing and all this stuff. Well, you're not cutting rates. I mean, everybody, we all talk about the lagging effect, right? They have minimal things they can do, like control the Fed funds rate. And they admit, everybody admits, there's a six-month, six to six, nine-month lag on any impact. So he's not looking out now and going, didn't you see the last GDP report? We can't cover. He's thinking, what the hell is going to be, what's this going to look like by June? And, that's, and so when he cut raised 50 basis points, everybody should sat back and go, whoa, wait a second. What the hell does he think is coming? And now they're talking about doing 50 more in November. So anyway, all these things um, are out there. And the geopolitics, talk about something that, I mean, it's totally unpredictable, right? Fog of war kind of, un, you know, unknown unknowns, unforeseen unknown consequences, all that kind of stuff. Uh, this, like I said, I wish I could sit here. I know there are people are, I, I see, you know, there are things on Twitter and I see the YouTube videos, you know, so-and-so says silver's going to 45. I wish I could say those kind of things. I got, I, I, I don't know, man, this is a, this is a crazy time. This is a crazy time. Well, speaking of Israel, one piece of news that can be found nowhere in the mainstream press, but that has been discussed by Rafi Farber is that Israel is in the process of waging a war on cash in their country with the 200 shekel bill potentially getting outlawed. Now there's some wording in that potential legislation that leads to that they could potentially outlaw precious metals, nothing concrete there, but also a concern, obviously. I was visiting Amsterdam recently and I was blown away to find that you cannot use cash. You literally cannot in 90% of shops. And even the ones where you can, they have signs up saying, please pay in card, please don't pay in cash. We have heard of Australia and other countries also moving in this direction. Obviously the excuses are everything you can think of in the book coming from politicians. Um, from back in COVID to cash will carry the virus so we can't be transacting with it to it's going to be more convenient, you know, it's for your own good type of, type of language. Why do you think governments are moving in this direction and do you expect this trend to continue and spread to other countries as well? Oh, Jesse, this goes back. This has been going on for 10 years now. And this is per five years pre-COVID. How do you pay for the hookers and the weed in Amsterdam, which is a card, is it? Do they, hookers, oh, you, you can pay with the weed using the card. Do they, yeah, yeah. I, I, don't, I don't know about the hookers. They have a thing That's a really phone? good question. I, I'm almost sure that they do. I can right. almost guarantee that they accept card you, there, yeah. Because right, for, be for weed, it's, you can buy it with card, yeah. You would be my source. Not that source. I know anything about that. Okay, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. You would be my source for that, Jeffy. Okay, well, let me know. Uh, maybe people can chime in in the comments. Um, but this has been, this is an attack on your personal sovereignty okay this this is ultimately to get you to have all of your spending power in the bank which is then controlled by the politicians and by extension the bankers which then ultimately i mean hey they don't like what you said online they don't like your social credit score 
no, we're not going to let you take any money out. Or, hey, you know what? Remember that statement that you had that said you had X number of dollars in the bank? Look, now it says zeros. Because we didn't like that you opposed one of our... I mean, people, again, this dude's crazy. No, this has been going on for at least 10 years, this war on cash, right? And it, it, in the end, it could just simply to be so that they can refloat the system without anybody complaining. You know, they just... This all like the central bank digital currencies. They don't have to, central bank no longer has to get approval like TARP, you know, or anything like that to save the banks. They can just create all this cash, you know, it's, it's these digital forms of money. Why the Israelis wouldn't want uh, people to own physical gold and silver? I'm not, I don't know. I don't know what the political rationale would be other than maybe they know you know, they know where this is heading in terms of what it's going to cost them to prosecute all these wars and everything else. And they need to print their own currency as fast as they can. And they don't want it, you know, people realizing what that's doing to their purchasing power. So they don't want you owning any physical gold. It's, I don't know. I'm not sure. Um, but that, you know, that comes to mind. But this notion um, that they will, you know, this war on cash is a real thing. That's why, I mean, they always, that's why they want to get rid of the physical cash. Like you said, they, well, it carries germs. Or the only people that use cash, you know, are just for nefarious persons, you know, like drug dealers and, you know, and junkies and bookies and people like that. They're the only people that need cash. Just use your card. It's the easiest thing in the world. Again, in the end, for me, this has always been a, a, an attack on your personal financial sovereignty because they want to institute policies and keep you right where they right where they got you um i'll give you a great example and again gold exposes their schemes which is why they hate it the easy the best thing i i, I don't know i got it saved on my computer or something i thought this was great remember when gold spot gold hit 2500 about i don't know a month ago no 2500 spot and I, I was seeing tweets and people say, oh, a London bar. You know, everybody's seen the, this is not a London bar. Okay, I just don't want people breaking in my house. It's a piggy bank. Okay, can we see that? Okay, but people have seen these things, right? A London bar. Good delivery, London good delivery bar. 400 ounces. It's not really, I mean, some are 90% pure all that kind of jazz, right? But people have seen a London bar, 400 ounces. And you can do the math. $2,500 an ounce times 400 ounces. It's a million dollars. And so there are all these, these things I saw. Oh, gold for the a London bar for the first time is a million dollars. Okay. It's the same London bar, man. This thing hasn't changed. If you go back 25 years or 50 years, it still is the same thing. Okay. Go back to 1971 when Nixon closed the gold window. That London bar, if you wanted to buy one, cost you $14,000. $35 an ounce. Okay. Fast forward 25 years or so, that same London bar cost $110,000. Fast forward another 25 years, basically today, it now costs a million. Same bar. Okay. So what makes clear for everybody to see the destructive monetary policies of the debt-based system where you just create more and more cash all the time than that, than this bar that never changes. It just costs you a million where it used to cost you 14,000. I mean, that just shows you the rest. So anyway, that's why they hate gold and silver. And that's why they want to keep you from owning it um, because it, lays bare for all to see how destructive their policies are. Well, stepping outside the gold and silver sector for a moment now, are there any other commodities that you're watching right now that you think may have upside potential? Up ahead, obviously, we hear a lot about a commodity super cycle. We have seen great performance from commodities such as uranium year to date. Um, copper obviously has done very well. Uh, what are you watching right now when it comes to metals outside the precious and monetary side of things? Well, those are the two. Uh, those are two I watch the closest. Those are two that I have, you know, kind of small investments in mining companies, ETFs and the like. Uranium, first and foremost, uh, you, I mean, 
<laughs> Who has it said the problem with uranium is you can literally see your profits melt down overnight, right? <laughs> I mean, we're one, one more, um, uh, three mile island, you know, one, whatever away from, uh, you know, all the uranium getting kicked back 20 years again. But you can't help but see the future demand, not just the big massive power plants, but the little mini uranium reactors that can power, you know, AI supercomputers or anything, right? So you can clearly see the demand side for uranium and there's just not that much supply. Now, the problem with it is it's not a growth. I mean, it seriously is not. I mean, it gets back to uh, the whole growth versus value thing. I mean, back when I was a stockbroker 30 years ago, you know, we had the rule of 72, right? If you could make 10% a year, your money would double in 7.2 years. That's the rule of 72. Make 9% a year, it'll double in eight. And you're like, damn, if I could just make 10% a year, if I could just make 10% a year, make 14% in five years. Well, now shit, Jess, if you don't make 14% in five weeks or five days, right? You're an idiot. So who has the patience for this? But long term for crying in a bucket, man, the, the, the uranium is just a great, play and you know it's going to do this it's going to you know like anything else you just i mean i think you accumulate on dips copper is the other one that the the supply deficit of copper going forward is significant the demand for future copper supply is almost exponential in the electrification of everything um so copper is another one now there are some really uh big producers and traders of copper that are massively short that seem to not want to see price get away from them. Uh, not the banks, like, but like Trapagura and some of the big trading firms. So there's always going to be that fight, but there's some economic reality there too. I mean, there are some others. And I think in general, um, the industrial metals, uh, aluminum, as Alistair McLeod likes to say, uh, nickel, uh, some of those, I think, but again, I, I don't own any, you know, zinc, you know, I, uh, I got, yeah, I got some zinc futures that I trade. No, but I, but again, I think commodities in general um, are probably in for a pretty good period of years ahead. Well, Craig, thank you for joining us today. A fantastic conversation as always. Tell us about the TF Metals Report, where people can find it, what it is you do there. Well, thank you, Jesse. I, it has been, what is today? It's October the 1st. November the 10th will be our 14th year. 14th anniversary. It was November the 10th. Maybe it was the 11th. See, I'm getting so old. Um, it was Veterans Day. It was Armistice Day, which is the 11th. So um, of uh, 2010 was the day that it started. And uh, I, if anything, it's a sh shelter in a storm for people. Um, you've got to get information. Um, and you've got to get it from trust, you know, people that you can trust. You can't, you can't trust the media to tell you what's going on. You just can't. The mainstream, the financial media, you can't trust to tell you what's going on. You got to think where do they dip their beaks, right? They got to keep their advertisers happy. They got to keep the mutual fund companies happy. They got, you know, all the money managers happy. So they're always promoting a narrative that helps their advertisers. They're not going to talk about the precious metals. They're not going to talk about the end of the Keynesian experiment and the debt-based system. All we're not going to talk about the stuff you and I have been talking about. So if you want to kind of be prepared, you've got to, I mean, my site is the place for that. And it's $15 a month. So it's not, you know, it's not free, but it's not like, you know, we're going to, you know, bank, break the bank by having you join it. But I think between the analysis we have there and then just the interaction with the global, global community of, of users, um, it's worth every penny. So uh, in this pivotal time, I sure would encourage people to, I mean, just try us out for a month and, um, and see what you think. I think you'll probably stick around if you do. Great, well, I'll put a link in the description below to the TF Metals report. Thank you once again, Craig. It's always a blast having you on and look forward to our next conversation. All right, brother, stay safe out there. And thank you for joining us today. This episode was brought to you by ARC Silver Gold Osmium. For all your precious metals needs, head to arcsgo.com and contact owner Ian Everard today at 307-264-9441 or by email at ian at arcsgo.com and make sure to tell him that Commodity Culture sent you. And I'll see you guys in the next episode. 
Commodity Culture is a series on commodities and natural resources. If you would like to see more, be sure to subscribe and hit the bell notification so you're always up to date with the latest episodes.